Hey guys, it's Guilherme and welcome to the second part of our 3D game series. In this part, we're going to understand how the Godot's unique node system works, and then we're going to create our player and add movement to it. Godot has an unique system to creating games that uses tree as its base structure. Trees are made up by nodes, and as every tree, the first node is the root of the game, and then we have different other nodes that start to branch off from this root node. So to begin with, we are going to add a new root node to our game. To do so, we're going to click on custom node. And here you'll see several different options. We're not going to go through all of them because there are too many. But now we're going to add the most basic node that exists, which is the node itself. So I'm going to click on him and then we're going to click on create. Now you can see that we have a node in our scene and this is going to serve as the root node for our game. I'm going to rename this node to game by double clicking on it and type in game and then pressing enter. Now with this node selected, I'm gonna press on this plus icon here to add a new node. And this is going to allow us to add a child node to the node that we have selected. In this case, it's going to be the game node, which is again, our root node of our game. You can think of nodes as building blocks to create your games that have prepacked functionality that you can use and customize to then create your game. By mix and matching nodes, we can then create scenes, and by using several different scenes, we can then create a game. On top of that, you can also add your own scripts, and with that, you got yourself a really powerful engine. If you already have a background with other game engines, it can be a little tricky to wrap your head around this concept, but with time and practice, I can guarantee you that it's going to click with no time. Now, before creating our player, it would be nice if he had a floor where he can walk on. To create this floor, we're going to search for mesh, and we're going to add a mesh instance to our game. I'm gonna click on create, and I'm already going to rename this mesh instance to ground, just so we keep our project really organized. On the right side of our editor, we have our inspector, and here we can define what mesh our mesh instance is going to render inside of our game. In this case, we don't have any custom models that we made in say Blender, for instance, and took inside of the engine. So we're going to use primitives. To do so, click on this arrow, on the right side of the mesh. And here we're going to select a quad mesh. Depending on the orientation of your camera, you might not be able to see your quad mesh because one side of it is invisible and the other is visible. Now we're going to expand the transform of our mesh instance. And here we have the data regarding the well transform of our mesh, which has to do with its translation, rotation, and scale. As of now, this does not look like a ground because its orientation is not correct. So in the rotation degrees, we're going to change the X to be minus 90. Even though this is better, our ground is still small, so we're going to increase its size by clicking on the mesh, which is going to show us lots of information regarding this resource, in this case, a mesh. And we're going to increase its size from one by one to 50 by 50. And now you can see that we have a way bigger mesh than we used to have before. We can press Ctrl S to save our scene, the engine is going to ask us where we want to save it. We can save it in the root of our project and leave the default name of game.tscn. Congratulations, we have created our first scene, which is composed by a root node and a mesh instance for our ground. We're later going to customize this by adding a material, but that is for another video. Now we are going to start creating our player, and to do so, we're going to need, as you probably have already guessed, another node. So with the game node selected, once again, click on the plus icon, or you can press a shortcut, which is Control A to add another node. And this time we're going to search for kinematic body. A kinematic body is a physics body. As you can see here, it inherits from it, which means that it's going to interact with physics. But in the case of the kinematic body, it's going to interact with it, but it's not going to be affected by it. This means that us, the developers, have all of the control over the kinematic body and how it's going to behave. This is really good for arcade types of games, and suits perfectly the player of ours. So I'm going to double click on the kinematic body. And once again, I'm already going to rename it and I'm going to call it player. Also make sure that you have added the player as a child of the game node and not as a child of the ground node. If you look closely, you can see that we have a little yellow triangle here and it's telling us that our kinematic body does not yet have a collision shape. This means that the engine cannot know how it's going to interact with the other objects because it does not know what shape this object has. Let's fix this by adding another node as a child of our player. And again, I'm going to use the control A shortcut and I'm going to search for collision shape. Now we can press on create and this is going to add a collision shape to our player. And here you can already see how the game tree works in Godot. We have a root node, which is the game. Then we have a node, which is the ground, another node, which is our player. And then we have a child of that player, which is a collision shape. 
Now we solved the problem that we had in our player that he was asking for a collision shape, but we have a problem here in our collision shape itself. That is because we haven't assigned a shape to it. And to do so, we're gonna go to our inspector and here on the shape, we're going to select a sphere shape. I'm going to zoom in so we can see what we're dealing with. And it might be a little hard to see what we're doing because of the colors, but in your screen, you'll be able to see this small ball that we have, which is now our collision shape for our player. If you look closely, our ball is halfway inside of our ground. This is not optimal, so I'm going to select the player and bring him up a bit using the 3D gizmo. Around there is already good, it doesn't have to be perfect, we just don't want our player to be halfway inside of our ground. Once again, we're going to save our scene, and if we try to play our game now, and to do so we have to click on this play button on the top right corner, or we can press F5, the engine is going to ask us which one is our main scene. Which scene does the game begin from? So we're going to click on select and as we only have one scene, in this case the game, we're going to select this scene and the game is going to start. As you can see, this does not look like anything that we have inside of our game. This is because the game is showing us our 2D view because we don't have any camera inside of our 3D game. And to fix that, we're going to close our game. With our player selected, we're going to add a camera to it. So we can search for a camera, double click, and now we have a camera inside of our game. To see what the camera is seeing, we can click on the preview on the top left corner. And now if we press F5 to play our game, you'll see that we're seeing the same thing that our camera is showing on the editor. Now what's left is giving movement to our player, and we're going to do so by creating a script that is going to control our player. With the player selected, we can click on this plus icon on the right side of our scene that is going to attach a new script to our node. On the template, we can change from default to no comments. And as for the path, we're going to select a new one. So click on the folder icon on the right side of it. And we're going to create a new folder. It's going to be called player. And inside of this folder, we're going to save our player script. Now we can click on create. And the script editor has already been opened for us by Godot. I'm going to minimize the output here. And now we can start to program our player. First of all, we're going to define a class name for our player. As you probably have already imagined, it's going to be called player. And then we're going to export a few variables. Exported variables gives us the advantage of being able to edit them without having to dig into code. This is really useful when you're working with designers that do not have experience in programming and it also it speeds up your workflow because you won't have to keep digging into code to change or tweak variables. The first one is going to be our movement speed and it's going to be a floating point value with a starting value of 10. And the second and last variable that we're going to have here is going to be the rotate speed which is going to define how fast we look to either the left or the right which again is going to be a floating point. It's going to be initialized with a value of 3. We can delete the ready function because we're not going to need it here. Now if I save this script and select the player, you can see that we have these variables here that we can use to, again, tweak the values that we have without having to dig into the code. I'm going to go back to the script editor and I'm going to create a function which is called physics process. This function is called on every tick of update that we have inside of our physics engine, which means that it is in sync with it and it's safe to perform actions that have to do with our physics without breaking anything. As we want to move our player, this means that we will have to check for inputs. An easy way to check for inputs using Godot is by the use of actions. And before using them, we're going to have to define them. To do so, we're going to go to the project, project settings. On the top, we are going to switch from general to the input map. And here you can see that we already have some actions predefined to us by Godot. We're not going to use them here. Instead, we're going to create our own. The first is going to be backward, the second forward, then left and right. You can see them here in the bottom and as of now they're not going to do much because we don't have any event defined to them. To add an event to an action, you can press on the plus icon on the right side of it and here you have a few options. If you have a controller with you, feel free to add a joy axis to the actions, but in my case I'm going to use a keyboard so it's going to be a key. The backward is going to be S, forward, W, left is going to be A, and right is going to be D. Now we can close this menu and inside of our physics process, we're going to create a new variable called Z movement, which is going to be of type float, which is going to tell us if our player is moving forward or backwards. 
to check for the actions that we just created, we're going to access the input class. And here we're going to call the function get action strength. This is going to return to us a value between 0 and 1.0 in the case that we are using a axis. But if you are using key presses like I am, it's going to be a value of either 0 or 1.0. You can see that the engine is giving us options for the actions that we just created. So the first one is going to be backward. And we're going to perform a calculation. It's going to be minus input dot get action strength of the forward action. With this, if the player is pressing the S key, we're going to get a value of 1. If the player is only pressing the W key, we're going to get a value of minus 1. But if he's pressing both of them, we're going to get a value of 0 and we're not going to move the player. And now we're going to do almost the same, but for our rotation. So we're going to create a new variable, which is going to be called rotate. Again, it's going to be a floating point. And we can copy and paste what we have on top here. But instead of checking for the backward, we're going to check for left. And instead of forward, we're going to check for right. We are then going to modify the rotation of our player based on the rotate variable. To do so, we're going to access the rotation. In this case, it's going to be the Y value because we want to rotate around this axis. And the value of rotation.y is going to be plus equal our rotate times our rotate speed times delta. Delta is a variable that tells us how much time has been passed between the last frame and the one that we are currently in. By multiplying this calculation by delta, we guarantee that if we have a different frame rate on a different computer, the player is still going to behave as we expected and he's not going to be slower or faster because of that. Now that we have calculated our rotation, we're going to calculate a direction to which we want to move. And this is going to be a vector 3, which is going to be equal to a new vector 3. It's going to be started with 0, 0, and 1. And the reason why this is 0, 0, 1 is because we want to move on the Z axis of our player. So to move forward or backward, but we want this value rotated around the axis that we are rotating our player. To do so, we're going to call the rotate function on our vector tree. Here we have to pass to it a parameter, which is which axis we want to rotate this vector tree. In this case, it's going to be the Y, because remember, this is the value that we are changing here. So it's going to be a vector tree, 0, 1, 0. And the second parameter is the rotation. In this case, rotation.y. And now that we have a direction, we can calculate our motion, which again is going to be a vector 3 that is going to be equal to our direction that we just calculated times our Z movement times our delta times our move speed. So we calculated our direction. We're multiplying this direction by the Z movement. So either to the front or to the back. We're then multiplying it by delta to once again, make sure that every instance of our game runs at the same speed. And finally, we're multiplying it by our movement speed. Now we have everything in place and we can call a function from our kinematic body, which is move and collide and press to it our motion. We can delete this pass keyword here and save our game. And now if we press F5 to play our game, you'll notice that we can already move around using the WASD keys of our keyboard. If we move all the way to the edge of our ground, you notice that our player is not going to fall. This is because our player is a kinematic body and, and as I said before, he is not affected by the physics of our game. If we wanted him to fall, we would have to implement our own physics and as this game does not need it, we decided to leave it out of this tutorial. And finally, before ending this video, we're going to save our player as a scene by clicking with the right mouse button on top of it, going all the way here to the bottom and clicking on save branch as scene. Then we can select the player folder and save it as player.tscn. And now if you look at our scene, we have our game root node, the ground and our player scene that if you want to access, we can do so by clicking here on this icon or by going to the player folder and double clicking on player.tscn. This way we can edit our player and every modification that we do in our player scene is going to be reflected on every instance that we have of our player scene inside of our game. This concludes this video. You now have a basic understanding of nodes and we have a functioning player scene. In the next video, we are going to create a maze for our player. So I'll see you there.